here knowing you more because of the words we've heard, because of the way that we've interacted together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been almost three and a half years since the day that he dropped everything and uh, to step into a new life that he didn't know what was going to happen. He could still remember Jesus' whisper loud enough only for him to hear amidst the whole crowd. Those words, come and follow me. Come and follow me. Peter knew very little about what he was getting up, uh, getting into, but something inside him told him this was the most important decision of his life. Several years later, he could barely even remember the days when his only goal was to actually catch fish in the Sea of Galilee. And he and these other guys that Jesus called disciples had seen the blind sea, the dead rise, the, the, waves, became storm, uh, ca the waves became calm and demons were cast out, the paralyzed were able to move again. And even crazier was that at some point Jesus actually told them to do the miracles. It never gets old seeing the look of joy on a man's face as he walks for the first time after a lifetime of being paralyzed. And here they were in their third Passover meal together as a group. And somehow this one feels just a little bit different. As the guys found their spot around the table, Jesus didn't go directly to his seat. Instead, he got up and he took off his outer garment. He got down on his knees next to a basin of water and he began to wash the other guy's feet. And the others, like Peter, were speechless. Jesus had spoken about serving others countless times, but this was too much. This was kind of going a little bit too far, and Peter couldn't stop himself. He was the last one to come to, and Peter couldn't stay quiet anymore. And he says, no, Lord. No, Lord. You'll not wash my feet. Jesus looked deeply into Peter's eyes, much like he'd done over the three years, when they first, three years ago when they first met. And he said words that once again would forever change his life. And once more, Peter extended his feet out slowly. And in disbelief, watched as the creator of the universe washed the gunk out from between his blistered toes. We're in week five of our Made for Mission series. And for those of you who maybe haven't been here and haven't uh, caught up, uh, let me just give you a quick summary of where we've come from this. But the, the very first week, we talked about the fact that we are all called to mission. And uh, calling is not for the spiritual elite, it's for every single person. And uh, week two, we answered the question, what's my mission? And we discovered that our mission is the same as Jesus' mission, so we'd better find out about that. And we kind of summarized that up on the board over here. We exist to make disciples. And then week three, we asked the question, what's my message? If I'm called and I'm going to do Jesus' mission, what's the message that I have? And uh, the message very simply is that we're supposed to share how God's goodness has intersected with our life. What difference has God made in your life? And finally, Last time we talked about who's my mission and we said that it's simply those around us that God has strategically placed in our circle of influence and there are people that we connect with. You know, uh, we have the ability through our church database to be able to map where people live in our community. If you've given us your address, we're able to, to know where you live. Okay, It makes, sounds silly, but I want to show you this and I know it's kind of little small and you probably can't see, but... Some of you might be able to see if you, live, if you live at the front. If you're sitting at the front, there are some red dots and there are some blue dots. Well, the red dots means that I've zoomed in far enough to see where that, there's one family there. The blue represents I haven't zoomed in far enough because those blue dots may mean there's three families in that community or four or five or, or multiple. And so if we were able to zoom in just to get a smaller part, we'd see all red dots. But that just kind of shows where you live. Right? around the city of Gympie. It doesn't go out as far as where I live, so it doesn't go out, as, out to Chatsworth area, so there's a whole bunch of areas there. But what I love about that is that I can see the influence of this church. That's just the congregation. If we looked at 
those who've had any contact with the church, it's much broader than that again. Much broader than that. In fact, when I look at the map of Australia, I can see little dots almost in every state of Australia for people who've been connected with this church. Now, if you think about it, we're called for a mission to make disciples. We're called to be an influence in our world. And God has strategically placed you and me in a neighborhood, in a street, in a workplace, in some community where we're surrounded by people who do not know Jesus. <laughs> we're surrounded by people who don't even have a thought about who God is, or not even interested in who God is, and so somehow we have to show them who Christ is. That's the beginning of our discipleship journey. Show. And we want to share the message of the gospel with them. That's so. Stay with me. <laughs> and once they become a Christian and they know what it is to follow Christ, they, they want to begin to know what it is to actually be a disciple. And then God does a work in their life and he begins to grow them so that they might go. Makes sense, doesn't it? All right, not yet. All right, let's talk a bit further. When we think about the church, not as the building that we gather for worship in, but we begin to think about the church as the people. The influence of this church is why. I'll say that again. If we start to think about the church not as the building that we gather together in, but begin to think of the church as you and I, as individuals, interacting into our community, then the influence of the church is incredible. Today we're asking the question, why am I on mission? Why am I on mission? Can we just flick that? Thank you. Maybe while you're here together, you get pumped up to live out the mission that God has placed you on the planet to live. But in the craziness of life, I wonder whether sometimes you ask yourself the question, why can't I just be a normal parent instead of being a parent on a mission? Why why can't I just see my school as a place to go where I learn some stuff rather than seeing it as a mission field? Can't I just attend like everyone else instead of having in the back of my mind that I'm here on a mission? My job's hard enough. Do I really have to try and force my co-workers now to listen to spiritual conversations that I'm trying to, to create with them? Sometimes I think we wonder, is it really, really hard work? And before we dive into today's passage, let me speak to those of you who are brand new to this whole God, church, Christianity kind of thing. As you're trying to figure out the whole thing, I think it's important to understand that Jesus is inviting us to a beef stew relationship, not a TV dinner relationship. Okay? You know the TV dinner? You, you, you kind of get a, a packaged meal and there's little compartments where all the, the food is and so you've got your chicken in one and the broccoli in another and you can eat the chicken but you don't have to eat the broccoli because broccoli is from the devil and uh, <laughs> I love broccoli it's okay <laughs> and you've you've got your life like that you know, it's all compartmentalized you've got one little compartment called family and you've got another little compartment called job and you've got another little compartment called finance and another little compartment called spirituality and they're all kind of compartmentalized. I don't think that's the Christian life at all. It's more like a beef stew. You know, if you've got a beef stew, the, the thing with the beef stew is that the food's all mixed up. And so it's much more difficult to pick out the broccoli if you don't like it. But you kind of, you, you dig your fork in or your spoon in and you, and you kind of eat the whole lot. Can't. A Christian life is not compartmentalized. It's we are who we are. And you're not just a Christian when you gather with other people who have similar, belief, similar beliefs. You're a Christian every day of the week. And it's not like a hierarchy. You know, we often hear this, God first, family second, church third, you know, others fourth kind of thing. It's not like that. It's God and everything else fits in. <laughs> it's my relationship with God 
And everything flows from that relationship. I don't stop being a Christian when I'm with my family or at work. Well, I shouldn't. I'm changed because of the power of God. It's a beef stew kind of relationship. Didn't know you were going to get culinary uh, expertise this morning as well, did you? So we're going to go to John chapter 13 and uh, read the first five verses of John chapter 13. And it's the story of Jesus gathering with his disciples about to wash the disciples' feet. I'll put it up on the screen there. But it goes, it was just before the Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world, go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The most frequent response that people had to Jesus was utter amazement. They simply just did not see things coming. They certainly didn't see at this last Passover that Jesus celebrated with them the disciples didn't see it coming that Jesus was going to now wash the dirty grime off his disciples' feet. I wonder if that's ever been your response to Jesus. Maybe it was before, but now we're kind of accustomed to things because we've been Christians for so long. and We kind of know the drill. And I wonder if that's how the disciples felt after three and a half years of following Jesus around. They kind of knew the drill and, and uh, you know, it was kind of like yawn, another blind guy can see. And you're another paralyzed guy can walk. And you're, oh, this is not some, hang on, what's going on here? This is something new. Jesus, the, the Savior, the, the, the Lord, the, the Master, the Teacher, he's getting down and he's starting to wash the disciples' feet. And I think the disciples were all of a sudden struck with amazement again. But the reality is, Jesus didn't turn the mission on and off. He was always on mission. It was who he was. And one obvious difference was that he was God, and I think it's more than that. He also knew why he was on mission. And it was stronger than any of the other reasons that he could come up with or excuses that could have gotten him off track. Just think about some of the excuses that maybe Jesus could have used instead of getting down to, disciple, uh, to wash the disciples' feet. He could have said, well, actually, we're having a nice meal with my friends. Having a good time. <laughs> I don't, why would I interrupt this with, with that if I'm, you know, I guess it, I get it if I'm on a mission trip, but if I'm not on a mission trip, I'm just having a meal, why should I bother? Or he could have said, well, the people at this table don't deserve it. <laughs> they failed many, many times. He knew that Peter would deny him later that night. He knew that the devil had already touched Judas. Uh, it's one thing when people are ser you're serving are grateful, but it's another thing to actually serve people who aren't grateful. Jesus could have used the excuse and said, well, you know what? These people don't deserve it. Why would I bother? But his servant's heart was bigger than that. Thirdly, he could have said, well, I'm well overqualified. <laughs> I'm well overqualified. He's the creator of the universe. Washing someone's feet wasn't even part of a servant's role. He could have easily built a strong case that this was far beneath him. He could have said, I'll serve, but just not that. Fourthly, he could have said, well, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Another time, Jesus spat in the dirt and he made some mud and he washed it on a blind man's eyes and he was able to see. But this was different even after Jesus washed their feet. They were going to go out into the dust again and it was going to get dirty again. <laughs> It's not going to make any impact. It's not going to make any difference. It doesn't make the food taste any different. What's the point? Fifthly, maybe it was a really undesirable task as well. No human being should have to clean the nasty gunk between someone else's toes. It's not as strong as other excuses, but I, I bet that was not something he really wanted to do. And finally as far as excuses go, he had far bigger things on his mind. He was about 
be arrested, tried, and crucified. We read that an hour later he was kind of sweating drops of blood because of that, what was ahead of him. If there ever was a time to think about some bigger stuff rather than getting down on his hands and knees and washing the disciples' feet, that was it. He could have used that excuse, couldn't he? Yet here he is with every excuse in the book to not. And here he is again, amazing those people who were closest to him. And I wonder whether this is one of the most selfless points of his life to this point. How do I stay focused on the mission even when I don't feel like it, even when I feel stressed, even when I feel anger towards those that I'm trying to actually minister to? Remember our picture of our homes? The foundation of Jesus' ministry, his mission, flowed from his identity. And I think it's the same for us. Lots of things that shape us how we see ourselves and often how other people think of us. But what if your true identity was actually found in God? This was who Jesus was. He, he knew who he was. He was the son of God and his mission was clear. He knew whose he was. He was the father's. There was nothing to fear. He knew what he was here for. The time had come to pay for the sins of mankind. He knew where he was going. He would leave this world and go to the Father in heaven. His eyes were looking far beyond the cross. And he knew where the power came from. He knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And I want you to look through that list there. And as followers of Jesus, that's true for you and I. It's exactly the same. We know who we are. We know whose we are. We know what we're here for. We know where we're going and we know where the power comes from. It's exactly the same. What if our mission was founded on the true identity of who we are in Christ? And Jesus' identity was so secure that that doesn't answer the question of what led him to wash feet. <laughs> My identity is in Christ, but it's never inspired me to do what he did. John 13, verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said not everyone was clean. What a crazy response. If I don't do this, you can have no part with me. One of the simplest descriptions of this is found in three very short phrases. Four out, four in, four out. Four out, four in, four out. We begin... By pouring ourselves out to God, we share with him the good and the bad and the ugly. And like a good parent, Jesus wants to hear about our stresses and our struggles and our fears and our passions and our dreams. Then after we pour out to God, guess what? He pours into us. He pours into us. It most happens, uh, happens mostly through his word, through reading his word. But it can also be through other godly people. It can be through circumstances. It can be through the Holy Spirit in prayer. He fills us up with encouragement, with conviction, with guidance and wisdom. And then from that overflow, we pour out to others. We give out of what God has done in us. And you see this in Jesus' life. In John chapter 11, Jesus and the disciples go away to pray together. Away from the crowds pouring out. In John chapter 12, Jesus is anointed with an expensive perfume in preparation for his burial. This is the pouring in. And now in John chapter 13, we see him washing the disciples' feet, pouring out. And right after that scene, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane where he pours out his heart to God. 
and God sends an angel to come and minister to him, he pours into him. And then he goes from that place and he gets hung on a cross. He pours out. Pour out, pour in, pour out. To the depth that I pour out to God is the depth that God pours into me. To the depth that God pours into me is the depth that I'm able to pour into others. I want to show you something very simply. Sometimes our lives look a little bit like that. They're filled with gunk. And if you're smart, you probably wouldn't want to drink that uh, very often. It's filled with all kinds of gunk. What happens is, when we come to God, and I hope I'm not going to make a mess here, but let's see how we go. We pour out to him. And here's what he does for us. I know there's still a little bit in there. And he pours into us. And sometimes we've got to do that multiple times multiple times but then we can pour out to others and by the way unless you've been poured into you've got nothing to pour out unless you pour in so we come back to God again And he fills us up for all the things that we can now use to pour out to others. Pour out, pour in, pour out. But what would happen if you never took the time to pour out to God? What if you stayed like that? What if your life was still filled up with all the gunk and you never took time to actually come into his presence and just to give yourself to him? You've got nothing. Nothing of value that you can pour out. You see, when we're on the mission, it comes out of the relationship that we have with God. We can't do our mission statement. We can't make disciples whose changed lives transform the world in which we live unless we pour out ourselves to God and allow him to pour into our life. And so for Peter, God is doing this very thing. By washing his feet, he's giving a powerful object lesson of replacing nasty feet, that's the pour out, with clean ones. And Peter's first response is, no way, this is not going to happen. And here's what he's saying, he said, Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you can have no part. There's nothing to give. You can't do the mission if you haven't poured out to God so that he can pour in. There's nothing left. Because from the very beginning, Jesus' ministry, or Jesus' primary call on Peter's life had not been ministry. It was intimacy. Think about it. Jesus told Peter on day one, follow me, not do what I do and get in line. He invited him first and foremost to a relationship. And then he goes on and says, and I will make you a fisher of men. Notice Peter's job was not to become a fisher of men, but simply to follow Jesus and allow him to make him a fisher of men. Pour out, pour in, pour out. And we get all this stuff in our lives that make us forget what our real identity is in Jesus. And God wants to actually cleanse us from those things so that we can be used by him now for the mission that he's given to us. And made for mission means having an intimate relationship with God. You can't separate out the mission 
from the intimacy of your relationship. You can't do it. Look at John 13 again, verse 13. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also do what? Wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. He tells them to go and do the same. He says, as I've poured into you, you now go and pour yourself out to others. But he can't do that unless we pour out to him in the first place. This story has multiple layers, but not only do we see where Jesus puts his foundation to stay on the mission, even when everyone else would give up and walk away, we also find that God pours more of himself into us and he'll lead us to even greater levels of service and sacrifice. The more you build that intimacy of that relationship, the more God is able to pour out to others as well. And everyone else in our world is about upward mobility, get a better car, get a better job, get a better house, get a better paycheck. But God's actually into a downward mobility. And it's so foreign to our culture, but it's his way. He exchanged the throne of heaven for a cross on earth. And before you write off his words as cruel punishment, listen to what he says next in verse 16. He says, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. By the way, he doesn't say do these things so you will get brownie points. Right? Do these things so that you gain this, go up the scale, this upward mobility. He says, if you do these things, you'll be blessed. And I think there are two me main reasons why he says we're blessed, and we'll finish with this. Because I think the more you serve and sacrifice out of an overflowing cup, the more you're like Christ. And the more you serve and the more you sacrifice, the more you're with Christ. Can we flick that again? Thanks, Jess. And as we live on mission, it's huge. It's huge that our why is secure. Why are we on mission? And it's simply that our identity is found in Christ. It's not found in any other way. We don't have to seek approval in our work or in our, our relationships and our accomplishments and our abs and our biceps and our boyfriend and our girlfriend and our husband, our wife, our kids or our parents. We are fully approved by God. You are God's child. Our identity is in him. We sing a beautiful song at Mainly Music. I don't know whether we're doing it tonight. Uh, we probably will. Simply called God Made Me. God Made Me. We're doing it tonight. <laughs> and it says that you're special. And you're made unique. And that's exactly what it is for you and I. We are created in his image. He has uniquely equipped us and made us. Nobody else has the shape that you have. I'm not talking physical shape. Nobody else is like you. No one. So our identity is not found in what we do. Our identity is found in who we are. This next week, I want to encourage you, if you can, pour out all the stuff that's hindering you from being what God would want you to be. Pour it out to Jesus. And allow him then to pour back into you. Paul says in Romans, how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And as you spend time with God each day, as you spend time getting to know who he is and building that intimate relationship with him, he'll send you out with beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. And beautiful feet only come from being with Jesus. And let me warn you, you might not get it right. <laughs> Peter and his clean feet fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane an hour later when he was supposed to be praying. A few hours later, he denies even knowing Jesus and he runs off in guilt. So what does Jesus do? Well, a few days later, Jesus meets him on the beach where it all began. 
And what do they do? Peter pours out, Jesus pours out into Peter and Peter pours out to 3,000 at Pentecost. So I want to say to you this morning, don't give up on a God who has never given up on you. Satan whispers in your ear, you can't do it, you are nothing, don't stretch yourself, you'll fail. And God whispers in your ear, I still believe in you, I'm not done with you, the best is yet to come, you have no idea, just trust me, one more day, get back up, I'll be strong in your weakness, you've got this, we've got this, you're not alone. You know, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark comes from the testimony of Jesus, uh, of Peter. It's written from Mark's perspective, but it's, it's basically Peter's story. And, and you know what's so cool? When a few dec- or decades later, when Mark writes down this gospel and he's listening to Peter, Peter includes in all of those stories, all of those failures. You see, his identity and not, is not found in what he's done. His identity is in Christ. And you can just imagine Peter saying to Mark, oh, and that's when I screwed up and then cut the dude's ear off. (laughs) And that's when I fell asleep and that's when I took my eyes off Jesus and I began to sink. And that's when I said I didn't know him. And and, and you can imagine Peter explaining to Mark his failures and it doesn't hurt anymore. (laughs) Because his identity is not in what he's done, it's in who he is. The foundation of mission flows from our identity in Christ. We have a mission. We exist to make disciples, to change lives, transform the world in which we live. And that mission can only be achieved when we understand who we are in Christ. Pour out, pour in, pour out. Let's pray. Father, we know we fail, we know we, we blow it. We know there are many times that we don't do the things that you want us to do, even with the best of intentions. But Father, I want to pray that you give us the courage to get rid of the gunk in our life, that stuff in our life that needs to be cleaned up. That we would just lay it at the, your feet, Father, and, and allow you then to fill us again, not with stuff, but with yourself, with those values that you hold to. Oh God, do a work in our life so that we would have a servant's heart. That we would today, Lord, go from this place ready to actually give out of what you've poured into us. That's what fills us with joy. That's what changes our life. So Father God, we give you thanks, we give you praise.